Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Carlos Corrado, pastor and founder of Christ Point Church, Melbourne, the place to belong. Thank you and bless you for joining us and allowing us to come to the sanctuary of your homes once again to share God's Word with you. We at Christ Point Church, Melbourne, are here to share the good news of salvation to everyone, beginning right here at home in the beautiful city of Melbourne, Australia, all the way to the ends of the world. The church is not a building, but a group of people who believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and have a true relationship with the Father in heaven, and are a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. We at Christ Point Church, Melbourne, want to be able to help people connect to their destiny, and their destiny is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We then want to equip them to go out into the world and connect others to their destiny also by sharing the gospel of Jesus. The Word of God tells us this in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This morning, we have Pastor Roger Dale, who will be leading us through his message entitled, Love, Love, Love. And I encourage you to stick around as we hear what God has to say to us through this standalone message. Next Sunday, the 30th of May, Pastor Peter Anthony will be delivering his powerful message entitled, deception. So we invite you to join us on this Sunday coming at 10 a.m. Now remember also to join Pastor Peter and Tony every second Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. as he takes us through an in-depth study of the Holy Scriptures on our second channel, Christ Point Midweek, which you can find through our app. We at Christ Point Melbourne are also interested in making sure that our children, that your children, are pointed to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So we encourage you as a parent to find the Christ Point Kids TV via our app, where our goal is to share the gospel to our and your children, and we do this through pointing kids to Christ. Christ Point Kids TV Pointing Kids to Christ This week, we have continued to hear and to see on the news in regards to the delicate and volatile situation in the land of Israel. Now, more than 2,000 rockets have been fired throughout the week by extremists to the land and the people of Israel. We as Christians need to pray for those struggling and suffering, in particular, to pray for Israel and for its peoples. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me and close your eyes as we pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, Lord of Heaven, we thank you for the blessing of life and health that you give us. Thank you for allowing us to have the opportunity to be in your presence again today, even if it is through technology. We come together with unity in our faith and ask that everything that we bind be bound in Heaven. We ask, Lord, that you soften our hearts so that your words can penetrate to the deepest part of it. May you clear our ears so that we may be able to hear your voice clearly. May you steal our minds as to think and focus only on you. May we always grow in maturity and strength through you. Be our Alpha and our Omega. Bless us beyond measure and fill us with your peace. We pray for those who are with ill health, struggling with cancer, struggling with COVID-19, kidney failure, and other illnesses. Please, Father, bless them and heal them according to your perfect will. Give them peace to know that you are in full control and that no matter the situation, you will be honored and glorified. We pray that you remain with us as we hear from the Holy Scriptures. We pray for Roger as he brings us a message of encouragement this morning. I ask that you put words into his mouth that become a blessing to those who hear them. May it be the Holy Spirit using him to convey the message that you have for every single one of us listening and watching. Now we bring forth a special petition, Heavenly Father. We pray for Israel. We pray for a seizing of the hostilities against the holy nation of Israel. Lord, we pray for restoration and reconciliation in the Holy Land. We pray for the Jewish people in Israel and throughout the world to be restored and reconciled to God, to you, through faith in Jesus the Messiah. May God continue restoring the land of Israel and that the nation will recognize 
that it is from your hands, Heavenly Father, and not their efforts. We pray, Father, for the reconciliation between Jews and Christian people, Jewish and Arab people in the land of Israel and all over the world. Our Father in heaven, rock and redeemer of Israel, bless the state of Israel and its people. Shield it with your loving kindness, envelop it in your peace, and bestow your light and truth upon its leaders, ministers, and advisors, and grace them with your good counsel. Strengthen the hands of those who defend the Holy Land, grant them deliverance, and adorn them in a mantle of victory. Ordain peace in the land and grant its inhabitants happiness. Heavenly Father, I especially pray for all of those in Israel who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah and Savior. I pray that in your grace, you would use him to be a true witness of the love of God and the forgiveness and salvation that only comes through his only begotten Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that individually and as the body of Christ, the church would be used by you to be a light to lighten those in Israel whose eyes have been blinded to the truth of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that many Jewish men and women would come to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I know that you are the God of Israel, the rock of their salvation, and their promised Redeemer, and that you have promised to one day give them the true inheritance in their land as promised to their forefathers, Abraham, when Jesus reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords over all of the earth. Lord, I pray for that time when as a nation they will accept Christ as their true Messiah, and so all of Israel shall be saved. But Lord, in your grace and mercy, I pray that you would use your church in Israel to witness to your people who do not know the Lord Jesus, so that many come to Him as Savior very soon. We pray this and a whole lot more in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Stay with us as we continue with our praise and worship. Feed 
without borders Let me work upon the waters Wherever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior
Remember to download the Christbank Church Melbourne app, free from the App Store and Google Play. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook. And visit our website. Christ Point Church Melbourne, the place to belong. What steals your focus? What keeps you from surrender? Are your eyes fixed on Jesus? Or are you caught in the distraction? Life itself can blur our vision. We may be looking at Jesus, but we can't see Him clearly. It comes down to priorities. Anything before God equals life in the blur. If we can seek first His kingdom, His glory, His purpose, life will come into focus. Step out of the blur. Focus on what matters. Refocus. Red Door Church and Christ Point Church Melbourne Winter Camp, June 2021. Refocus. Good morning church and welcome to this, to this morning's service entitled Love, Love, Love. Trust you've had a great week and as we join together today, I hope you join with me in prayer as we pray for this morning's message. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're able to come together in this your house and to hear 
your words. And may the words that I preach today be words that come direct from you. And as people are listening, may they not hear my speaking, Lord, but may they hear them speaking directly to their hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would open the hearts of all who are hearing today and that you would prepare each one of us for the message that you have. So, Father, continue to bless us and help us as we go throughout today and throughout the coming week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible says we're to love one another. Sounds good, but can we really do it? Whoever said, I love mankind, it's people I just can't stand. People are just irritating. I agree with the guy who said, to live above with those, how we love, oh how that will be in glory. To live below with those we know, now that's another story. Even at church we can find dif people difficult to love. Sometimes we used to sing a chorus in church that goes like this, you may know it. I'm so glad you're a part of the family of God, was the first line. And then we turn and look at the person beside us and think, or perhaps even sing, I'm surprised you're a part of the family of God. Sometimes it's hard enough to love our own family, let alone our church family. One guy told his wife that if he'd really loved him, she would have married someone else. Someone once wrote, if you love something, set it free. If it comes back, it was and always will be yours. If it never returns, it was never yours to begin with. If it just sits in your living room and messes up your stuff, eats your food, uses your telephone, takes your money, and never behaves as if you actually set it free in the first place, you probably either married it or gave birth to it. It could be. Love, love, love. That is what our world needs. But the world is often mixed up when it comes to love. First and foremost, we must consider what the Word of God says about love. Let's consider what the Bible has to say regarding love. Firstly, let's look at Romans 12 verses 9 and 10, which states, Love must be sincere. Hate that which is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. This sounds like how brotherly love is supposed to work. Are you devoted to any brother or sister in Christ? Do you honour them above yourself? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17 tells us this. For this reason, I am sending you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. It's easy to love a faithful brother in Christ, is it not? It's far easier to love a faithful brother than an unfaithful brother. Pastor Ashok, my Bible college lecturer, is over 70 years old. He's been a Baptist pastor in several parts of the world, including South Africa and England. In addition, he's also lectured and run Bible colleges in several countries. He's been involved in ministry probably for more than 50 years, and he's very faithful and consistent in his work and preaching. He's a good teacher and preacher of the Word. He does his homework, often calls his people, he ministers to his people faithfully, and it's very easy for me to love him as a brother. Furthermore, Ephesians 5 verse 25 reads out, Husbands, love your wives just as Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It should be obvious that both husbands and wives should love one another. Sometimes, however, it's one-sided or lopsided. Marcelina, my beautiful wife, always says to me, I love you most. I simply say, okay. Recently, my cousin 
and her husband celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary. My cousin wrote these words on Facebook. I am the luckiest woman on earth today. Today I have been married 25 years to the most wonderful man who adores me and spoils me constantly. I love you and hope we can spend another 25 years together. Wow, pretty great, wouldn't you say? Where does this kind of love come from though? I think we all know. The Lord is the author of true love and this is what our text is all about. So how do we make love a dominating ca characteristic of our lives? Firstly, we need to make love a priority. We've already heard that loving people is difficult. Yet, this is what the Bible commands. 1 John 4 verse 7 tells us, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. We spend time on what we deem important. For many of us, the choices we make are valid. Time with family and friends, work, prayer, serving the poor, fighting for rights, protesting wrongs. But as the scripture reminds us in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3, if I donate all of my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Even though we have the freedom to set our own priorities, Jesus made a point of defining certain non-negotiable priorities for us. The Bible instructs us in Matthew 22 verse 37 through to 39 to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. And again in John 13 verses 34 to 35 we can read, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for the other. Love then is not a grey area according to the scriptures. Jesus gave love priority over all other Christian virtues. Notice also that we are to love as Christ loved us. And how did Christ love us? By going to the cross and paying the price for sin on our behalf. Every thought, response and act of goodwill must first pass through the fine filter of love or it means nothing at all. When Benjamin Franklin wished to interest the people of Philadelphia in street lighting, he didn't try to persuade them by talking about it. No, instead he hung a beautiful lantern on a long bracket before his own door. Then he kept the glass burning brightly and polished and carefully hung it at the approach of dusk. People wandering about on the dark street saw Franklin's light a long way off and came under the influence of its friendly glow with grateful hearts. To each one seemed to say, come along my friend, here is a safe place for you to walk. See that cobblestone sticking out? Don't stumble over it. I shall be here to help you again tomorrow night, if you should come this way. It wasn't long before Franklin's neighbours began placing lights in brackets before their own homes, and soon the entire city awoke to the value of street lighting and took up the matter with interest and enthusiasm. Example is always a strong motivation for doing the right things in life, and the Lord gives us the best example of all. A study once disclosed that if both mum and dad attend church regularly, 72% of their children remain faithful. If only dad attends the church, 55% remain faithful. If only mum, 15% remain faithful. 
and if NOVA attended regularly, only 6% of children remain faithful. The statistics speak for themselves. The example of parents and adults is more important than all the efforts of the church and of Sunday schools. Most of us are what we are today because of our parents' example. Likewise, if parents are loving, then there's a very good possibility that their children will also be loving. Now, if you were to say to your child, do as I say, not as I do, you might not get any affection out of them. But Jesus said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. I seriously doubt that we'll ever love exactly like Jesus did. But when we demonstrate love to others, we're walking in his steps. In Strength to Love, written by Martin Luther King, he encourages us to realise that our responsibility as Christians is to discover the meaning of this command and seek passionately to live out our lives, live out our love in our daily lives. But why love? What makes it so important? I want us to look at love and understand the importance of love. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, that whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now this is a challenging scripture. Why? Because how can anyone fully describe our God who is love? But John is clear. If you don't love, then you don't know God, because God is love. God is the creator of love, although that in itself is a poor way of saying it, because God is more than just the creator of true love. Mark Guy Pierce, a Methodist preacher from the early 1900s, used to tell of the time that he overheard one of his children admonishing the other. You must be good, he said, or father won't love you anymore. Calling the boy to him, he said, son, that isn't really true. But you won't love us if we're bad, will you? The boy asked. Yes, I will love you whether you are good or bad, Pierce explained. But there will be a difference in my love. When you are good, I will love you with a love that makes me glad. When you are not good, I will love you with a love that hurts me. This is a similar picture of God as revealed in the story of the prodigal son. How do you really describe in words God who is love? I'm not sure that there is any way you can. God is not the essence of love. He is not the spirit of love. He is not the extreme example of love. He is not the personification of love. He is not the epitome of love. He is love. And we will know when we come into his presence just how much he loves us. When Jesus spoke to the disciples regarding the first and second greatest commands, he explained that all the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. And to the people of Israel, as well as for many believers today, it would seem more logical for obedience to be the peg from which the law hangs, since the point of writing a law is adherence to it. It is written in John 14 verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The Apostle Paul goes on to tell us in Romans 13 verse 10 that love does no wrong to a neighbour. Love, therefore, is the fulfilment of the law. This may sound irrelevant to our generation if it depends on police departments, violence and force to uphold and fulfil the law. Yet Jesus' simple command requires greater strength than any of us naturally possess more power than any man-made weapon. The logic of Paul's interpretation of Jesus' command that love fulfills the law seems equally simple. For if one loves his neighbour, 
he will not commit adultery with his neighbor's spouse. If he loves his co-worker, he will not lie to him. If he loves his enemy, he will not slander him. Love fulfills the law, because if we truly love every person, because he is a person, we will not desire to hurt or violate him or her. Thus, we will never break the law. God established love as the impetus for obedience. Then how do we embody the distinguishing nature of love? When we demonstrate Christian love, it distinguishes believers from the rest of the world. If you remember the verse we looked at earlier from John 13, Jesus goes on to say, By this, love, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Notice, Jesus did not say that people will know that you are my disciples if you promote my agenda. Wear Christian t-shirts, or a WWJD bracelet, or have a fish decal on your car. All we need to do is love one another. A watching world will be persuaded not when our values are promoted, but when they're incarnated, when we become purveyors of love. It is as though Jesus has given the entire world the right to judge whether or not one is his follower simply on the basis of their love for fellow human beings. The vivacious virtue of love distinguishes the Christian. We need to be and follow Christ's example. We need to show love in our actions. From the very beginning, God's plan was to develop a people that reflected his character. And what is his character, you ask? Love. We are reminded of this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, which states, God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. In this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, for we are as he is in the world. Believers are God's advertisement to a watching society as to how individuals could best live in that society. In fact, Christian love will always be the best apologetic that the church has. When Ira Gillett, missionary to East Africa, returned home to report on his activities overseas, he related an interesting phenomenon. Repeatedly, Gillett had noticed how groups of Africans would walk past government hospitals and travel many extra miles to receive medical treatment at the missionary compound. He finally asked a particular group why they walked the extra distance when the same treatments were available at the government clinics. The reply, the medicines may be the same, but the hands are different. That's the virtue of love incarnate. That kind of love makes a difference. Christ has no hands but our hands, no feet but our feet. We are his ambassadors, representing him to the world. And when we love as he has loved us, it will make a difference. People will notice. Christian love is indispensable. Before closing today, I want to quickly look at three ways we can demonstrate the virtue of Christian love. So how do we demonstrate the, dis the distinctiveness of Christian love? How can we practice the glorious virtue of love? It's simple. Love values the other person. Let's not confuse Christian love with its modern counterfeits, lust, sentimentality and gratification. While love is a wonderful warm feeling, it's not only a feeling. In fact, according to the Bible, love is primarily an active interest in the well-being of another person. Love always acts for the benefit of others. 
according to William Barclay, love is the spirit in the heart that will never seek anything but the highest good of its fellow man. God loved us not because we had something to offer him, but rather because he had something to offer us. I'm sure we'll all know the verse from John 3, which reminds us, For God so loved the world in this way that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God loved us so that he could demonstrate his mercy to us in the person of his Son. Dr. Wally Criswell former pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, officiated at a lot of weddings. The nervous groom would always ask Dr. Criswell, how much do you charge for conducting a wedding? And he'd always smile and look back at the groom and say, oh, just pay me what you think she's worth. Dr. Criswell made a lot of many money from weddings because to each man, his new bride was of extravagant value. In a like manner, everyone around us is of incredible value to God as a potential object of his mercy. His one and only Son died in their place. Because people matter so much to God, they ought to matter to us. And we therefore need to love them as God loves them. Secondly, love is vulnerable to the other person. In other words, love opens up its life to another person. It goes beyond sentimental feelings. It breaks down barriers. It exposes the heart. Think about Jesus. He left the glory of heaven to come to earth. He veiled his divinity and took on humanity. And what did it get him? The Bible tells us in, 1 John, in John 1.11 that he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Can you imagine being away on a business trip for a week? Coming home to your family and your family not recognising you? That's similar to what Jesus experienced when he came to earth. Surely that must have hurt. Then, as Jesus hung on the cross, dying for these people that he loved, they hurled abuses, scorn and ridicule at him. His heart was broken and yet he forgave them. Christian love is the most costly investment you will ever make. C.S. Lewis in his book The Four Loves describes the vulnerable nature of love. He says to love is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe dark, motionless and airless, it will change. It will not be broken. Instead, it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. Thirdly, love entails a cost. Love gets its hands dirty. It takes a chance. It goes out on a limb. It takes a gamble. Love makes a statement and leaves a legacy. It does the unexpected, surprising and stirring. It performs acts that steal the heart and leaves an impression on the soul. Often these acts are never forgotten. I recently read a moving story about the founder of World Vision, the International Christian Relief Agency. Bob Pierce had advanced leukemia but he chose to visit a colleague in Indonesia before he died. And as he and others walked together through a small village, they came upon a young girl lying on a bamboo mat next to a river. She was dying of cancer and had only a short time to live. 
Bob was indignant. He demanded to know why she wasn't in a clinic. But his friend explained that she was from the jungle and wished to spend her last days next to the river where it was cool and familiar. As Bob gazed at her, he felt such compassion that he got down on his knees in the mud, took her hand and began stroking it. Although she didn't understand him, he prayed for her. Afterwards, she looked up and said something. What did she say? Bob asked his friend. His friend replied. She said, if I could only sleep again. If I could only sleep again. It seemed that her pain was too great to allow her a relief of rest. Bob began to weep. Then he reached into his pocket and took out his own sleeping pills, the ones the doctor had given him because of the pain from his leukaemia was too great for him to sleep at night. He handed the bottle to his friend. You make sure this young lady gets a good night's sleep, he said, for as long as these pills last her. Bob was ten days away from where he could get his prescription refilled. That meant he was likely to have ten painful and restful nights. That day his love cost him greatly. But even in the midst of suffering, God infused him with a supernatural sense of satisfaction that he'd done the right thing. I'm not saying that we should constantly abuse ourselves or become passive doormats. But Christian love inevitably carries a cost. Even when the cost is high, we can nevertheless count on God to bring fulfilment to his followers. For true love always costs. If there is no cost, there is no love. In the end, the goal of Christian life is love. The measure of our maturity is our love for God and our love for others. If we fail in our love, we have missed what it means to be a Christian. But there is hope for one who has failed in love. At the beginning of this message, you may remember I asked the question, can we do it? Can we really love others in this way? The answer, I'm afraid, is no. We cannot love others like Christ without Christ. The Lord who forgave even those who crucified him stands ready to forgive you of your lack of love. He wants to show his mercy toward you today, to cleanse your loveless heart and fill it with his loving Holy Spirit. All you need to do is receive his mercy. Place your trust in Christ and let him teach you how to love as he has loved you. We all desperately need a heart transplant. We all need the heart of Jesus. And as we acquire it through faith, study, surrender, submission, etc., we'll love, 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 just like Jesus did. I'm Roger Dale for Christ Point Church Melbourne, and may God bless you. Join us again next Sunday as Pastor Peter Anthony leads us through his message on deception. Okay, now let's pray. Father, we thank you because we know that you love us. We thank you that you loved us so much that you died on a cross for our sin. We pray, Lord, as we've heard your message and heard you speaking to us today, that that will have impacted our hearts and that we will reach out in love to you so that you can reach out in love to us. May we never be found wanting in love, Lord. Help us to love others, love our families, love our wives, and to be the example that you want us to be, the example that you are to us. So, Father, help us each as we go into this coming week to be your example. We pray that you will lead us as you would want us to be led. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Man
streets be filled with joy May injustice bow to Jesus
The preacher has finished his message. It is now for you to make a decision to come to the Father through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If you want to accept the Lord Jesus into your heart today, repeat this prayer with me from the bottom of your heart. Dear Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner and need your forgiveness. I know you died on the cross for me. I now turn away from my sins and ask you to forgive me. I now invite you into my heart and life. I now trust you as Lord and Savior of my life and I will follow you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you made this prayer with me, let me welcome you to the family of God. I encourage you to contact us through our contact details on our webpage, Facebook, and YouTube, Christ Point Melbourne Online. If you like to know more about Jesus, Please make contact with us and we will help you and equip you in your new journey in Christ. But also to go out into the world and continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others who do not know him yet. God bless.